Hey, good morning, you guys. We're here for day three, May 30th. This is, this is Thursday, and I'm excited to see what today's events bring. The first uh, presentation is going to be about circadian, circadian rhythms and sleep and how it impacts uh, health and athletic performance. So we're going to take some notes. So anyway, stay tuned, you guys. We're going to get some awesome content. Live presentations like this right here. And you've got all these awesome books, literature, the latest information, various topics. The book that I checked out was this one. And another one that I looked at was this one. Body Composition Assessment. And so we're going to do some more interviews today, guys. It's going to be awesome. Here's a fascinating study on percent body fat that is um, basically formulated or tabulated from waist to height ratio using a regression model. Now, what I find fascinating is that relative body fat percentage is a predictor of health status. Waist to height ratio better indicates disease outcome and adiposity related disorders. Then does body mass index or waist circumference. So waist to height ratio, we just actually started using this. I actually just started using this to my clients. But as you can see here, there's actually a um, correlation that they found with waist, waist to height ratio in body fat percentage. So having a lower waist to height ratio in males was associated with lower percent body fat and the same for females. And what's fascinating is here are the equations. So this could be really cool because I may actually incorporate this in my own practice. Um, it's really easy to get waist to height ratio. You simply have to accurately get their waist measurement, but also their height measurement, and you take the waist divided by the height, and you come out with a, a um, you come out with this, uh, with a decimal here, a zero point something, and based on that, you can actually now extrapolate and estimate body fat percentage. How fascinating. This is a great, great study. Here's another truly remarkable paper. So 
last year I did the uh, hand grip strength test, right, with the grip dynamometer. And here, so bone mineral density is important, particularly for reduction of risk of osteopenia and osteoporosis, okay? Now, what's fascinating is this study found a significant uh, moderate, moderate association between grip strength and bone mineral density. So as grip strength went up, so did bone mineral density. And I think that's truly remarkable. And so essentially what we're looking at here is the potential of hand grip uh, strength to be a surrogate measure of bone mineral density based on this paper, which is truly informative and remarkable. So I was just astonished by this. It's just amazing what you can learn, which obviously supports what they're concluding in that increasing upper body strength uh, via hand grip may serve as a predictor of bone mineral density in male and female athletic populations. So truly fascinating. So, hey everybody, this is Jenna here from the Functional Movement Screening, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Functional Movement System, sorry. Yes, screen is part of it. Um, so the first thing that you're going to do is actually to remove your shoes. Okay. That's going to let us standardize it depending on the day. We're always going to get the same one. And also you get some candidates to move your shoes. So I'm just going to describe what you're going to be doing uh, so that you get an idea. And then I'll tell you if you do any trials or anything like that. Uh, so we're going to do three different directions. We're going to start with the anterior reach. So when you do it, you're going to start with one foot behind the other one. Your other foot starts behind the other This is your starting and your ending position. So you have to come back to the position under control. So you're going to stand on one leg and when you see that red bar on the box, you're going to push out under control as far as you can maintain your balance and then come back under control. If you lose your balance, we don't count the trial. If you step out in this area, So many things that people do to try yes. to get the thing out. Yes, yeah. people are very creative. Well, yeah, well, they're competitive too. So we're going to do both sides. We do about 46 uh, repetitions on each side. So we're going to do first plateau. We only take your best. Wow. Okay. So even if you have some crappy ones in there, that's not a big deal. Uh, so let's start with our hunt just to be kind of standardized. And so that's your starting and your ending position. Is that okay? That's great. Yeah. Now you're going to push that out. It's a balance between trying to push as hard as you can and you take a risk or yes, being safe exactly. and conservative. Yeah. So you do need some, you know, good clean trials, but if you try too far, you stick down, you just want to just be down. Good luck, you know. Yeah. Good luck, you there. Uh, and then I would go back onto your other foot, and now you're going to go back behind you.
All right, so we're here in the poster hall, and I was very fascinated by this study because it's on wetsuits, and I was just speaking with, your name is Boram? Hello, my name is Boram, the doc student at University of Las Vegas. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So we were just talking about the wetsuit, and then you, I was telling you about how I've never used it, and there's a race that I'm thinking about doing in November, the water's going to be colder. So this is a perfect study to maybe learn something about the wetsuit. Yeah, correct. So yeah. go ahead and just uh, tell me like what you were telling me about the wetsuit, the two main reasons it's used for. Okay, two main reasons people wearing wetsuit doing open water swim. So one is thermal regulation to maintain the cold temperature during a long swimming. And then the second one is get more buoyancy force. So wearing a wetsuit can maintain the cold temperature and also easy to make the, their streamline. So to reduce drag force and yes. wave foam drag. Yes. So what what were you uh, what was the purpose? What were you looking for? Like what, what were you trying to uh, uh, find with this, this study? study? Yes. Okay. And what did you find? So we was investigate if muscle activity is different uh, by influence by wearing different three different wetsuit. Okay. So no wetsuit and sleepless wetsuit yeah. and full suit wetsuit. So we measure muscle activity and we measure stroke weight. So muscle activity is not significantly different okay. between anterior and posterior deltoid. Okay. But stroke weight significantly different. Which wow. means swimming swimming speed equal stroke weight multiply stroke length. But stroke length doesn't change across the wetsuit condition. Uh -huh. Stroke weight is significantly different especially in non slip but no wetsuit and full slip wetsuit. There's no significant difference between slipless and full slip. Okay, so your your recommendation to me in regards to and and so, from my race. Yeah, you told me you never tried the Wesson before, so right. I recommend you to uh, try both. It also important how fit the Wesson to you. So we, it's really really tight. It's more muscle activity. Uh huh. So you got fatigue faster. Yeah. So. choose wrong west to fit it's really feel like chalk it's hard to zip it up yeah i'm definitely okay, gonna pick still, one that's that's yeah, uh gotta, yeah one one west that's west not west too tight one that's not yeah. too tight and also when you participate in a triathlon event you can see all different types of wetsuit some people wear swim skin and full suit wetsuit and slip lift wetsuit uh -huh. so you need to find the one that you like so right. I recommend you try, try both before you actual race. Yes. So you can choose. Oh, this one I like sleepless. I like full sleep. Yeah, that's and that's that's great advice. Yeah. That's exactly what I'm gonna do. So I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much.